you ever had a single moment in your life, a moment that changed everything. It's turning 16 and finally getting to drive for the first time. It's your wedding day, knowing you're spending the rest of your life with one special person. It's the day you first look into your child's eyes. It's the day you realize they're all grown up. Life is made up of moments that change everything. But there is one moment that touched everyone's life the same. One moment in time that will touch your life your children's lives and their children's lives. One moment that will forever go down in history as the moment that changed everything. He is risen. Well, happy Easter Sunday. Welcome to Belong Church. We're so glad that you're with us. And perhaps a better way to put that is happy Resurrection Sunday, because it isn't about Easter. It is about the resurrection. I love the bumper video and how we got to see that it is about that stone being rolled away. And I just love that image of it. And, and I love the fact that the bumper video even talked about, hey, there's, there's a lot of days in our lives that are important, but this day changes every one of those. And your children and your children's children and, and your life and all these different events. And that just makes me so happy to think about my children having children and then great grandchildren one day, a long time from now probably. But um, I, it just makes me really happy and it makes me to smile a lot. And I just want to give a special welcome to everyone who's joining us. And perhaps it's your first time and maybe even a friend has invited you to join in because for the last several weeks, we've been asking everyone to have a, a friend, a partner, somebody that will take this journey with you. So if you're joining us for the first time, I'm Pastor Kevin, and I'm so glad you're with us. And we're just going to try and break it down this morning and look at some different things. And I'm probably not your normal actual message that you will see or, you know, the spin of everything. You probably aren't going to experience what you would expect would normally be there. In fact, if, if this is your first time or maybe you haven't done this yet, I just want to invite you to send a text Welcome, the word welcome, text the word welcome to 469-289-1114. And that's simply our text communication system. It's not going to do anything. No one's going to show up at your house. No one's going to bring you a loaf of bread. It's just a way that we can communicate back and forth with you. It's going to ask you some questions back and forth, and it just begins the dialogue. Well, this morning, today, I want us to look at who Jesus is. And so much of the time, I feel like that we end up looking at all these different things and, and it's part of the message, it's part of church, it's part of it's learning about God is all the different attributes of him. But today I want us to look, and this is really what was just dropped down in my heart to do today. And it's kind of funny because it dropped in my heart and I started working towards that end. And the more that I started adding it in there and the, when I ended up with this message, I was so excited and I couldn't wait for this moment to share it with you, because who he is, is amazing. So you're going to see up on the screen, it starts off with he is, and we're going to fill it in along the way. So if you're taking notes, this is a really great opportunity for you just to start and, and write down he is, and then we'll fill in some blanks as we go along. But the first one I want us to look at is a prophecy of Jesus a long time before he actually came along, hundreds of years before, in Isaiah Chapter 9, verse 6 says, For under, unto us a child is born. And this again is hundreds of years before he was actually there. But he's speaking, speaking it as if it was right now. And so oftentimes the word from God is, hey, this is what is happening. But it hasn't happened yet. But the, the context and the, the tense is it is right now. Look at this. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called, look at this, who is he? He is wonderful. He's counselor. 
He's a mighty God. He's the everlasting Father, and he's the Prince of Peace. Right off the bat, who he is, he's wonderful. And so oftentimes, you'll hear me probably at the end of this message even say, if I could take Jesus out of my heart and put him in yours, you would understand how wonderful he is in that split second. You never want him to leave. And, and the counselor that when you have a situation that you don't know what to do and you don't know what, what the answer is, and rather than sitting there talking to everybody else around you, you, you can go and pray and you, could, you can talk to God. In fact, one of the things that we've talked about in the last several weeks has been exactly that. Just to shoot up a one-minute prayer, a 30-second prayer, multiple times a day. Not about sitting there and like, got to have your cup of coffee, you got to have your, that's great for some people, but man, if that's not, if you're not there, if you're just starting, it's just a, God, I got this situation and can I give it to you? And then go on. Maybe a few minutes later, or maybe an hour later, God, this situation, <laughs> it's still bothering me. Uh, can I give it to you? And maybe you do it 10 or 20 or 30 or a hundred times a day. He's our counselor. But in giving it to him, he comes back and he returns back to us. He's a mighty God. He's the everlasting father. He's the prince of peace. If you need peace in your life, who should you be praying to but the prince of peace? He is a healer. And in this time of, of great calamity and great uncertainty and, and all of this, oh my gosh, the, we hear every single day the, the death toll and the number of people who are infected. And, and, and from the 6 o'clock news to the 10 o'clock news, and they're telling you all the numbers that's happened in the last four hours. And so like, it could be mind-blowing. But can I tell you, one of the attributes of God, of Jesus. He's a healer. In Exodus 15, 26, he says, I'm the Lord your God. So this is God speaking. Listen carefully to my voice. Do what is right in my eyes and pay attention to my commands. Obey all my rules. And if you do, I will not send on you any of the sicknesses I sent on the Egyptians. Look at this. I am the Lord who heals you. God's saying, one of my names, one of my attributes that I'm just going to come out and just lay it right out on the table is, I am the God who heals you. So if you find yourself in a place of needing healing, you need God to intervene in your life, I'd have that scripture up on my car and the dash. If you can't drive right now, put it on your mirror, put it on your nightstand, put it everywhere you go. God says, I am that to you. I am that God who heals you. He is, next, faithful. He is faithful. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, you are tempted in the same way all other human beings are. Hey, there's nothing that you're going to be tempted with that every other human being isn't tempted with. But look at this. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted any more than you can take. But when you're tempted, God will give you a way out so that you can stand up against it. Can I just tell you another way? When, when you've got these situations that you find yourself in this place that you need to call out to God and you say, God, I thank you that even from the message I heard on Easter Sunday is that you're a faithful God. He's right there with his hand outstretched, ready to pull you because he will give you a way out. Can I tell you, he is patient. Kind of goes right along with that last one. For 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow to keep his promise. He is not slow in the way some people understand it. In other words, you can say, Hey, man, I prayed about this, and it didn't happen right away. So God must be slow. No, it's not slow in how you or some people understand it. In fact, he is patient with you. He doesn't want anyone to be destroyed. In fact, instead, he wants all people to turn away from their sins. He wants everybody to turn away. Look at the next screen. To turn away from your sins. He wants you to face the struggle and understand that when you prayed and asked him, he's going to keep his promises. May not be on your time. But he wants no one to be destroyed. He doesn't want everything in your life to be destroyed, but he wants you to turn. He wants me to turn from the things that I miss it. Look at this. He is consistent. 
Hebrews 13, 8 says, and I've got a whole bunch of scriptures today. I'm driving Michael a little bit crazy, I'm sure, because there's a gajillion. I'm just boom, 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 boom. But this is who God is. And, and if, you're, if I'm going too fast or you're taking notes, you can always pause the video, rewind it, and, and catch back up with us. But he is consistent. Hebrews 13, verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Can I tell you the next one? He is spirit. John 4, 24 says, God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. So what does that mean, God is spirit? That means he's not a man like you and I or a woman. I'm not going to say like I, but, you know, he's not a human being. He is a spirit. He's that place, that, that God-shaped place inside of us that only he can feel. He says, and those who come to him to worship him have to come to him in the spirit and in truth. Next, he is a provider. Man, as we're going through this tough time, and, and for me, I haven't worked in, in, in my consistent, you know, having jobs, working every day and all this crazy schedule. I haven't done that for almost five weeks. And he is our provider. It wasn't me as a provider when I was able to work every day and crazy hours every day and every day of the week and trying to take a Sabbath day. No, no, no. It, it's God who is our provider. Ver Matthew 6, 26 says, look at the birds of the air. They don't plant or gather crops. I mean, they're not out there punching a time clock, trying to fulfill the, the needs they have so they can get paid and so they can get fed and they can have a place. He goes, no, they don't put away crops and storehouses, but your heavenly, fa your father who's in heaven feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they are? If God takes care of them, don't you think he's going to take care of you? In fact, one of the names in other places, and I could have just had scripture after scripture, I could have been a three-hour message today on all the different scriptures, but one of them is God also names himself, I'm Jehovah Jireh. I am the God who provides for you. Next, he is truthful. Numbers 23, verse 19 says, God isn't a mere man. He cannot lie. We have the ability to lie. We can say, there's nothing behind my back. I'm, I'm not, I didn't do that. Or I, We can lie. And some people can lie real easy, and some people can't. You can tell in their face when they, they, they're lying. But God isn't that way. He cannot. It's not within him to lie. He isn't a human being. He doesn't change his mind. He speaks, then he acts. Look at this. He makes a promise and then he keeps it. Man, I love that NIRV version of that. He makes a promise, and then he keeps it. Let me say it like this. He is a promise keeper. And, and one of the songs that's really popular right now, especially in, in the midst of all of this um, struggle, it's one of the top songs, is, is Waymaker. And one of the things is he's a Waymaker. He's a promise keeper. Man, every time I hear that, it just makes me smile inside to think, man, the promises that he gave me, another scripture says, are yes and amen. Man, he's for you. He's not ever coming over here beating you up. He is for you. He's wanting you to succeed. Next, he is perfect. And that perfect word means complete. It doesn't mean that he never makes mistakes. He doesn't make mistakes, but in the next thing, you're going to see how, how it affects me and how I'm like him. But he's perfect, but he's complete. Psalms 18 verse 30 says this, God's way is perfect. Hey, so when God says, hey, I've got a way for your life, and I've got this plan for your life that's going to be great. Hey, it's perfect, and it's going to be complete. And the, the word of the Lord doesn't have any flaws. He is like a shield to all who go to him for safety. Go to him for safety because he is complete. 
He is perfect. Philippians 1, verse 6 says, For I'm confident, the definition of faith, confidence, the same word. I'm confident of this very thing, that he, God, he, Jesus, who began this good work in you, when you ask Jesus to come into your life, when you take that opportunity at the end of every one of our messages to say that prayer, to say, God, I'm ready to give you a try. I'm going to step out and and see if you are really everything that I've heard. When you take that step, he begins this work in you. It doesn't just, sometimes you feel something, sometimes you don't feel anything. Doesn't change anything. It's still working. And it says, and he who began the good work in you will perfect it or complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Until, until Jesus comes again, he's constantly working on us. See, that change, all that change doesn't happen in one time. We don't become perfect. We don't become that we don't make any mistakes. We don't never miss the mark anymore after that when we say that prayer. No, we continue to take this step by step by step. But he who began that work in you, that's his job. It's not my job. Certainly it is my job as a pastor to perfect it in you. No, he who began that good work in you, it's his job to complete it or to perfect it. I could get so sidetracked on that one, I'm going to move on. He is compassionate. And this has got to be one of my favorite verses, my very favorite attributes, I should say. In Psalms 116, verse 5, it says, The Lord is gracious and righteous, and our God is full of compassion. One of the greatest things that always has jumped out at me when I've read through the New Testament, particularly in the Gospels where it's the stories of Jesus' day and what he did from day to day and, and the different encounters, of course. They said there's not volumes enough in the world to write everything that he did. And in the four different Gospels in Mark, Matthew, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all to, they all describe different things. Some describe the same things. But one of the things that always jumps out is it says, and he had compassion on them. And then he healed them. Our God is a compassionate God. If someone tries to paint a picture of God that is not compassionate, let me just tell you, look at me right and dead in the eyes, okay? That's not God. Because God is is compassion. Jesus had interactions with people who needed a touch from him, and it says he had compassion on them almost every single time. Next, he is with us. God is with us. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, the last part of it says, and this is where they're talking about Jesus coming as a baby and what he's to be called. It says, and he will be called Emmanuel. One of the names that he is called, Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now skip all the way to the end of the, the Bible in Revelations 21, verse 3. It says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, from the throne means it's God. Okay, it, it means it's Father God speaking. It says, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. See, before Jesus came, his dwelling place wasn't among the people. His dwelling place was only in the tabernacle. It was only in the Holy of Holies, and, and that's way too deep. I'm not trying to go in there, but it was in a place. It was in a building. So as we're faced right now, that every church in America is not able to meet in their buildings. And so many people are now live streaming. And, and there's so much that are out there today that are just like, man, they're giving it their best shot. Man, it's so awesome to see all this outreach that's able to go in. And I, I just, I love the fa fact that there's going to be so many churches that has changed for them because now they've been forced into this. But you see, the, the dwelling place that God has isn't any long in just any building. Everyone that was meeting in a building, and that's where you experience God, is, it's not about that. God's dwelling place is now among the people. Someone said that this is the first time in America's history that they have not been able to celebrate Easter Sunday. Can I tell you, that's not true. Easter Sunday is still being celebrated because it isn't being celebrated in a building. It's in the people. 
And look at this. And he, God, will dwell with them. God's dwelling place where he hangs out, his favorite place to be, is now among the people and to hang out with them. And they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Can I just break that last line up just a little bit? God himself will be with them. It means he's hanging out. He wants to be your best friend. He wants to be that person that you can just share the struggles that you're going through. He wants to be that person you can go to when you don't know what else to do. But he also wants to be the superlative. He wants to be your God. So he wants to be your best friend, but he also wants to be that person that you can worship two different roles of God that he takes. Again, man, I could spend so much time on each one of these. Can I tell you, this one's awesome too. He is love. He is love. There's so many messages that we've looked at over and over and over again, and and they all have to do with the love, but it's not the kind of love that we know, not even me telling my wife I love her. I often use the example that she tells everybody she meets, even people she's never met, and on the phone, I love you at the end, you know, or love you, or I love you, and all this stuff. It's not that kind of love. It's this unbelievable love that is there. And if you know my wife at all, you know she's an amazing person at loving. But this is an even bigger love than my wife can have. 1 John 4 says, verse 7, Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. That means before I can love you, I have to first get this love from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. One of the biggest things that we talk about over and over again, you see it's a little bit more bolded on knows God, but because everybody that takes this step in getting to know uh, this relationship and starting starts with knowing God. First, one of our tenets is to know God. John verse 13, verse 35 says, by this, everyone will know. How will they know? By this, everybody's going to know that you are my disciples. By what? If you love one another. In other words, if you don't love one another, it's going to be kind of hard for someone to say, oh yeah, you're a follower of Christ. No, this is the change. This is the transformation that comes inside of our lives when we take this step. Next, he is strength. Psalms 27 verse 1 says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And can I tell you that just energizes me right now with all of the bad news that's everywhere around us. The Lord is my light. He is my salvation. Uh, Who shall I fear? Uh, uh, some virus or something, while it's very serious, it's not bigger than the light that is my God. It is not bigger than the salvation that is my God. And God is going to be the strength of my life. And that prevents me from being afraid. This week was Holy Week. And I encouraged everybody to watch The Passion of Christ. And to see just the the different struggles that he went in. What he went through. He was a sacrifice for our sins. He is the sacrifice for our sins. See, the Bible says that the wages of sin, the wages of missing it, what you get when you try and do life on your own is death. Destruction. It's just not going to work. And somebody's got to pay the price for that. At the most basic uh, core level, when you boil it all down, it's either you're going to pay for your sins, and it's death, or you're going to receive Jesus being the sacrifice for our sins. 1 Peter, if you'll look with me, chapter 2, and there's several verses here. But suppose you receive a beating for doing wrong and you put up with it. Will anyone honor you free of that? 
So you did something wrong and you end up getting beat up because of it. Is there any honor in that? Is anybody going to feel sorry for you? No, of course not. But suppose you suffer for doing good and you put up with it. God will praise you for that. Now, it's talking in the context of Jesus. Had Jesus been doing wrong and had he been a sinner, had he missed it like we do? Remember last week we looked at, he was tempted like we, but yet he never made a choice to sin. He was sinless, therefore he was able to pay the price for all of ours. See, if, he'd been, if he had gone through all of the bad things, uh, if he'd went through all the things making bad choices like we make bad choices, we, we do things we don't want to do and we do the things we know we're not supposed to do, and then he got the beating that we talked about on Good Friday and the crucifixion, and you went through it. Is there any honor in that? No. But suppose him being perfect and him doing the right thing all the time and him never sinning. And then he went through it all. God is the one who praises that. The next verse says, Christ suffered for you. Man, if that's not all you can hear out of this message, that's it. He suffered, not because he made bad choices. He didn't suffer because he had made some wrong decisions. He suffered for you. He stepped in and took your place. He stepped in and took my place. And look at this. And he left you an example he expects you to follow in his steps. He left you an example. He expects you to follow in his steps. Verse 22. He did, scripture says he didn't commit any sin. No lies ever came out of his mouth. Remember we looked at that, that God tells the truth. It's, it's not in him. He doesn't have the capacity to lie. Verse 23, the people shouted him at him and made fun of him, but he didn't do the same back to them. See, we look at it and say the, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. And he's like, man, they shouted and made fun of him. It would have been real easy for him. And it's real easy for me to turn sarcastic when somebody says something wrong to me or something I even perceive wrong. It's real easy for me to flip it around and try and throw it back at them and sometimes throw it back harder. Sometimes I can get really carnal and I can have some really bad missing it moments. But he didn't do that. Look at the next screen. He suffered, but he didn't say that bad things would happen to them. Instead, look at this. Instead of throwing it back at them, instead of coming at them, he trusted in the one who judges fairly. Who is that? God. God the Father. See, he came to be an example for us. He came to say, hey, I could have lost it. I could have thrown it right back at them. But in his humility, and in his not losing it, in his being perfect or complete, he turned and he trusted in the one. Can I ask you this morning, today, whenever you're listening to this, will you consider trusting in the one who judges fairly? That means you don't need to defend yourself. That means you just need to say, God, I'm trusting in you. The same way Jesus did. And if you watched the Passion of the Christ, you saw him before Pontius Pilate. And he's like, well, is this true? Is this true? He goes, I'm going to be quiet. He trusted in the one who judges fairly. Next verse. He himself carried our sins. Man, it would be tough for one person to carry the sins of one other person. It'd be like, man, I, I've led this perfect life and I haven't, I haven't missed it, but now I've got to carry your sins. But then multiply that times everyone in the world. See, he carried my sins 2,000 years before I was even a twinkle. Before there was even a thought of a little Kevin, 
He himself carried our sins. Look at the next verse. In his body. It's not something he just like carried in the sky. It's not just something. No, he took this, this sin upon himself in his body. They, they drove real spikes into his arms. They drove real spikes into his feet. They f- r- shoved a real sword. They shoved a real crown of thorns in his body on the cross. He did it. Look at this. So that we would die as far as sins are concerned. Now, I broke it up like this on purpose because I don't want this to just go flying right over our heads. See, there's a price for sin. There's a price for missing. And I've already talked about that just a minute ago. Okay, well, there's a cost for it. There's a wage there. If you miss it, you got to pay for it. If I go to the store and I pick up something, I get to the register and I got to pay for it. He paid the price so that we, so far as sin is concerned, as far as paying for that, we're going to pay the price which is death. And as far as the sins are concerned, look at this. Then we would lead godly lives. See, his ultimate result in this, his goal, what he's looking for, the, the, the big win out of this whole thing is this. He himself carried our sins in his body so that we would be, that our sins would be dead. So far as the sins are concerned, the price has been paid. Why? Then we would lead godly lives. And that sin that he paid the freight for, that, that that he took in his body, those winds that he took in, in those cross that the nails are going through there and he died and he gave up his last breath and I really hope you watch it. If you haven't, go watch it now. But the agony of him dying on the cross for me was so that he could then live. And the last he is, he is risen. See, it would have been great if he just paid all this stuff for us, but then he's dead. And it would solve my, my sin problem for sure. But the greatest thing is that he didn't stay there. But he rose again. That wasn't the end of the story. He rose again. And that's what we celebrate some 2,000 years later. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Please bow your heads. I don't think there is a better day in the year to come to Jesus. And if, if you've been on the sidelines and you, you just don't know, you've been like, no, I don't know. And I've heard all these bad things. And, and, and you, maybe you've had some big questions going on in your mind. Or maybe you're one who's trusted God, but then something happened and you walked away. Maybe you're the person that I keep talking about frequently that's still just checking it all out like, I'm not sure. I've already said it and I'll say it a a bunch of times in the future. If I could take Jesus out of my heart just to give you a trial, just so you could experience for one moment, you'd never want him to leave. See, I'm talking about an experience. I'm not talking about a religious experience. Event. I'm not talking about all these things. I'm talking about being in this experience with a risen Savior. Can I tell you this? Regardless of how you got here today, no matter where you find yourself, what category you would put yourself in, today can be your day. And I simply want to invite you on this Resurrection Sunday to take that leap of faith to accept what he did on that cross for you as we celebrate the rising from the dead. If that's you today, I simply want you to say this prayer. Say, God in heaven, today I come to you. I'm going to trust in you. I'm ready to begin a real relationship with you. I want to know you. I ask you to forgive me for every time I've missed it. 
Thank you, Jesus, for giving your life for me. Today, I give my life to you. And the best way I know how, I'm going to live for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Father, I I just thank you for everyone who prayed that prayer for the first time, or maybe they prayed it before and they're coming back to you again. Regardless of where they're coming from, Lord, I know that you're sitting there with your arms outstretched, welcoming them in in the greatest way possible. Lord, I thank you for the ability we had today to look at who you are and all the different attributes, and we certainly didn't hit all of them. We hit some highlights. Lord, I thank you that you showed us the way to live, Jesus. You came to give us an example. And I thank you that you paid the price. Thank you for rising again. Thank you for paving the way, preparing it. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If that's you, I want to encourage you to take the next step with us. And I've already mentioned our text communication system. It's the same number. Would you text the word NEXT to 469-289-1114? And that's just an ability that we can communicate with you and tell you what your next steps would be if, you, if you're interested in taking it. And again, no one's going to show up at your house. No one's going to call you. No one's going to bother you. It's just a way for us to communicate with you. And we want to hear what's going on in your lives. We, we see all the different points in the world that people are listening or watching. And we see all the dif- different demographics. But we want to hear what God is doing. So please email us at info at belongdfw.com. And then I, I mentioned at the very top of this to invite somebody to take this journey with you. So I encourage you to copy this URL and and send it to somebody, to text it to someone, to email and say, hey, listen, I want you to, to take this journey with me. And we're so glad that you do. Lastly, and as we close, if you want to be a part of the giving solution that is this church and what keeps us going from week to week, there's many ways you can do it. The easiest way is to text to give, and that's simply to text the word give to 469-410-7788. And it's a different number because it has to be separate because it's finances. Again, text the word give to 469 469- 410-7788. Or you can s- simply um, just go to give to belong.com. It's in our app. We have an app. If you don't have it, you go to any of the app stores. It's there. Just search Belong Church and you'll see our logo. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you so much for sending Jesus. That he paid the cost for my sins. He, pay- he paid all the things that should have cost me. He did it for me. And Lord, I, I received that gift that he made. Father, I just thank you for this day that he didn't stay dead and buried and having paid the ultimate price. But Lord, your spirit, it says, raised him from the dead. You were able to quicken his body. You were able to quicken my body. Lord, I just thank you as we celebrate that today, that we look forward to what you're doing every single day and making us perfect, to making us complete, Lord, that you began this work in me. You began the work in all of us. Lord, and we give you all the thanks. Father, I thank you for everyone who's participating with us, those who are watching, those who have been checking it out, those who made that decision today. Lord, I thank you for everyone, and I speak a blessing over them that have, have tithed and have given to this church this week. Lord, I thank you that you're doing an amazing work here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.